I think IBM made the single worst mistake in the history of enterprise on Earth. They just had no clue about uh, a computer, what it could do. And so they, they just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. In 1981, the IBM PC generated $1 billion in revenue. IBM had estimated that they would sell 200,000 PCs in the first year, but their projections were wrong. They were selling 200,000 PCs a month. By 1982, they had an 80% market share of the computer industry. They were by far the biggest name in the computer industry. But if you look around today, you will not be able to find a single IBM PC anywhere. So how did IBM go from dominating and winning the computer market to not even being present in it today? This is the story of the IBM PC, how it won and then lost the PC market. Before the PC revolution, IBM was quite literally the most dominant force in the computer industry. They were so big in fact, that in 1969, the government alleged that IBM violated the Sherman Antitrust Act. They alleged that IBM was monopolizing or attempting to monopolize the general purpose electronic digital computer system market. IBM consequently unbundled its software and services to create a more competitive software market. The case would later be dropped. In the 50s and 60s, IBM's dominance of the computer market was almost complete, with the company making up 60% to 70% of all business computers worldwide. IBM's business was centered around large mainframes, which were big computers the size of a room that could do complex calculations. IBM sold the software that made these computers easy to use, and also provided services for companies that handled massive calculations like financial institutions. While business was booming throughout the 60s and 70s for IBM, something big was about to happen, something that was going to threaten their dominance of the computer industry. In 1974, the Altair 8800 is launched. It was a microcomputer that was a very basic miniaturized version of the IBM mainframe. It had switches you could flip to load instructions into memory and had LEDs that would display the output of the instructions you input. That is, if you had inputted them correctly. IBM's mainframe did the same thing but could handle much more data and could do far more complex tasks. But this was the first sign of the changing tides of the computer industry. Computers were getting smaller. In 1977, the next step in the PC revolution was taken, when Apple unveiled the Apple II. Not only was this a small computer that could fit on your desk, it had a screen and an interface that made it easier to use. The Apple II success created more interest in PCs, and soon many players began to spring up with their own versions of the PC. The PC was causing a lot of buzz, to the point where IBM's mainframe customers were telling IBM to enter the PC market so they could buy IBM's PC, which was the only legacy computer brand at the time that had built trust with its customers. The rest of the computer companies were barely five years old. As we discussed prior, IBM was and still is a massive company. In the 1980s, it employed more than 300,000 employees. Because of its size, IBM was very bureaucratic. The process of getting a new product to market usually took four or five years because of the various committees it had to go through for approval. But the PC market was moving very fast. In five years, a product that would have been just fine for 1980 would be obsolete in 1985. So if IBM was going to develop its own PC, it had to do it outside of its corporate structure of bureaucracy and do it fast. An IBM employee named William Lowe approached CEO Frank Curry to try and convince him to get into the computer business. In August 1979, as IBM's top management met to discuss their PC crisis, Bill Lowe ran a small lab in Boca Raton, Florida. Well, hey, Bill, nice good to, to see, see you again. Right. Yeah, I tried to uh, match the IBM passcode. How did that's, I do it? That's terrific. That's terrific. I'm sorry. He knew the company was in a quandary. Wait another year and the PC industry would be too big even for IBM to take on. Chairman Frank Carey turned to the department heads and said, Help! 
he kind of said, well, what should we do? And, uh, and I said, well, we think we know what we would like to do if we were going to proceed with our own product. And he said, no. He said, uh, at IBM, it would take uh, four years and 300 people to do anything. I mean, it, it, it's just a fact of life. And I said, no, sir, uh, we can provide you a product in a year. And he abruptly ended the meeting. He said, you're on, Lowe. Come back in two weeks and tell me what you need. Frank Curry's plan to have a PC ready within a year revolved around the idea of IBM spending as little time as possible creating the PC and rather focused on assembling it. Which basically meant that the first IBM PC was mostly made up of off-the-shelf parts. The operating system 2 was not developed by IBM. Instead, it was developed by Microsoft through a deal that allowed IBM to license the operating system for just $75,000. The operating system was called QDOS, or the Quick and Dirty Operating System. With this tool for modern times, a person can quickly master such jobs as accounting or word processing. Even use the IBM personal computer to forecast growth. All helping the business person at home to wear many hats. While selling even more. And that can be a feather in anyone's cap. The IBM personal computer. Try one on at a store near you. The big day came on the 12th of August 1981 when the first IBM PC was released. The IBM PC with its tagline, a tool for the modern times, generated $1 billion in revenue, far exceeding company projections. IBM's original manufacturing forecast called for 1 million machines over 3 years with 200,000 in the first year. In reality, Customers were buying 200,000 PCs per month. The IBM PC was a smashing success. It let corporate America know that it was okay to buy PCs. After all, people used to say, no one ever got fired for going with IBM. IBM had been the standard for decades with mainframe computers and now the IBM PC had instantly become the new standard for what a PC should be. The IBM name that had been trusted for decades by corporate America made the IBM PC an instant hit and gave the entire PC industry as a whole legitimacy to a broader market that included corporate America. IBM popularized the PC in what would be called the third step of the PC revolution after the Altair 8800 and the Apple II. All of a sudden, everyone knew what a PC was and they wanted one, and the brand on most people's minds was IBM which by 1982 had an 80% market share of the PC industry, and IBM's success began attracting competitors. What the public wanted was IBM PCs. So to be successful, other manufacturers would have to build computers exactly like the IBM. Remember how the IBM PC was built so fast? Most of its components were off-the-shelf parts. Well, because of this, it made it really easy for rival companies to just copy IBM. The IBM PC had set the standard for the industry, so companies began releasing PCs whose main selling point was, it's like an IBM but cheaper, or it's like an IBM but better. Most of the computers being released at this time had marketing that revolved around how similar they were to IBM. And because IBM used off-the-shelf hardware, it was very easy to build an IBM clone. To further add fuel to the fire, the agreement they had with Microsoft to build the DOS operating system allowed Microsoft to sell that very same operating system to other manufacturers. I think IBM made the single worst mistake in the history of enterprise on earth. Which was? Which was the, the manufacturer, being, being the first manufacturer and distributor of the Microsoft Intel PC, which they mistakenly called the IBM PC. I mean, they were the first manufacturer and distributor of that, that technology. I mean, it's just simply astounding that they could uh, basically give a third of their market value to Intel and a third of their market value to Microsoft by accident. So not only did IBM have parts that anyone could get, the same was also true for its operating system. Because of this, nearly identical clones began to spring up that challenged IBM. IBM was beginning to lose its lead and realized that the design of the first IBM was a big mistake. IBM changed its strategy. It negotiated terms with Microsoft and created a joint development agreement. This agreement was for Microsoft and IBM to collaborate on developing a new operating system called OS2. 
It was solely built for IBM and its computers. Microsoft agreed, but the interesting thing was, Microsoft was also simultaneously working on its own operating system called Windows, which was going to be an update to the DOS operating system that was initially built for the first IBM computer. OS 2 came out in late 1987, and it was a total disaster. IBM in trying to create their own operating system forgot one thing, the applications. Because this was IBM's own operating system, existing popular software applications built for DOS were not compatible with OS 2. The main reason why people were buying computers at the time was because of their applications like spreadsheets and word processors. A lot of these popular applications were not compatible with IBM's new OS 2. Consumers began thinking twice about purchasing an IBM PC. Maybe you could be fired for going IBM after all. So consumers began buying other PCs that were compatible with popular applications. Namely PCs which ran Microsoft Windows, which had launched before IBM's OS 2. IBM had just managed to go from industry standard to just another player and this gave a chance to its rivals to take its industry standard position. In 1984, Apple launched the infamous 1984 campaign to help promote the Apple Macintosh. The ad for the campaign was directly targeted at IBM, or Big Blue as they were nicknamed. The ad was showing how Apple was fighting against the tyranny of Big Blue, painting IBM like the dystopian Big Brother in George Orwell's 1984 book. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. While the Macintosh wasn't a success, the ad was a true reflection of how the computer industry as a whole felt about IBM. Such a strong feeling, in fact, that in the late 80s, Intel, Microsoft, Compaq, and other computer companies got together without IBM. Compaq, Tandy. Hewlett Packard, Olivetti, and NEC. It reads like a who's who of the high tech world, with the notable exception of IBM. The reason for this gathering? To discuss setting industry standards for the computer industry. This was a big deal, because all computers had Intel chips and most computers ran Windows. They no longer wanted to follow IBM's lead. Now they were going to take the lead, and IBM practically gave them this opportunity when they chose to build their own operating system. IBM had set the standard for the computer industry, but they didn't own it. The chips were from Intel and the software from Microsoft, and they were coming together to plot a future free of IBM's dominance or control. The result of the meeting was the extended industry standard architecture. Led by Compaq Computer, IBM rivals will unveil the new machines at a major news conference in New York. They decided to develop their own computer standard called Extended Industry Standard Architecture. Or EISA for short. Challenging the very standard IBM is pushing with its highly touted personal system to computers. IBM no longer had the power to direct the computer industry, and their operating systems and computers soon became less and less competitive. In 1989, IBM sales would reach a record low. The final nail in the coffin for IBM was the release of Windows version 3 in 1990. The popularity of Windows combined with it being the industry standard forced IBM to pull the plug on OS 2 in 1995. In just a decade, IBM went from having a 80% market share of the PC market to less than 20%. IBM seemingly made one blunder after another until they had nothing left. They went from ruling the computer industry to not even having a presence in it, forever confined to the pages of PC history. Ah.